Well, we are this year going through the sayings of Jesus, listening to things that Jesus said. And when you're talking about things Jesus said, you had to come to probably the most important one of all. And so turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to John chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17. John 3, 16, for most people who are raised in the church, it's the first verse that you memorize. You learn to say it. Even if you don't go to church, if you just like sports, you'll see signs that say John 3, 16 in the stands because it's a, it's a verse that gets to the heart of who God is, of how he loves, of what his gift of his son means to us. It really defines Christianity in a huge way in our Christian faith. It says, and we can read it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Boy, that is a mouthful. Now the context, in John chapter three, you might remember a Pharisee, a ruler, a leader of the Jews, had come to Jesus by night. And most of the Pharisees who came to Jesus came to argue with him. They came to Jesus in order to prove him wrong. But this guy Nicodemus felt there was something different about Jesus, and so he came personally. Perhaps he had come with a group before and heard Jesus' answers, but we don't know that. But Nicodemus came, and he said, Look, I know that for you to do the stuff you do, God has to be with you. That was a huge confession for a Jewish leader to say to this guy that they were threatened by, I know God's involved in what you're doing. So Jesus began this great conversation that extended through John chapter three. And among other things, he told the guy, you need to start all over. Unless you're born again, start life completely fresh you'll never even get, have a clue as to what God's kingdom is all about. Well, as he continued to talk to him, John 3.16 is kind of the core of what Jesus was sharing. This is the most profound thing that he had to say to this Jewish leader, and it, and it continues to be profound to us. And I think a lot of people have memorized John 3.16, but have never thought about it all that much. And so for me, as many times as I've quoted it, as many times as I've read it, when I look at it again, I'm blown away by everything that is here in these two verses, John 3, 16 and 17, and the surrounding verses that that support it. What we see in John 3, 16, first of all, is Jesus is explaining how much he loves us. He wants this Pharisee to understand the love that that God has is an amazing quantity and quality of love. And so he starts by saying, for for God so loved, here's how much he loved the world. To a Pharisee, that was already a shocking statement. For God to love, sure, a Pharisee knew that God loved, and they understood that if you want to relate to God, you need to love him back. But they felt like God loves a handful of people in the world, basically people who are fortunate enough to be Jewish or who are dedicated enough that they will convert to Judaism. And they wouldn't have a problem with saying God loves this particular group of people. They would even narrow it down further. God doesn't love Jews who don't sacrifice, who don't follow him. So it becomes a very narrowing concept. So to say that God loves the world would be shocking to him. See, the the Greek word cosmos is that's used here for world. It means the whole cosmological system, the entire integrated system of creation that God loves it. He loves the environment. He loves all of the people in the world. 
The word cosmos refers to an ordered system, something that's been arranged. Ironically, Carl Sagan, when he had a TV show, he called it the cosmos, even though as an atheist, he didn't believe that there was a God who had actually put the universe in order, and yet he looked at the universe and couldn't avoid the fact that, wow, this thing is integrated in an amazing way. It's, it's shocking. It's probably even a greater miracle if there's no God that it just happened this way randomly. But the concept of God loving the whole world system Everything that he had made, when, when God created, he made the, the galaxies, the whole solar system that we, that we live in, our galaxy, all the other galaxies, every intricate detail of creation, when he created them, animals and plant life and everything, he said it's good. But then the pinnacle of God's creation is when he made people and he said that they are very good. So the universe, the system, our ecosystem, is something more than just decoration. It's a part of what God loves because our whole ecosystem has been tragically affected by sin, by people doing what's wrong, by what we call the fall in Genesis 3. And when God looks at his creation, he loves it still. And that means he loves every person in existence as well as the entire environment. So for you know, a Pharisee, this would be really surprising, that God loves the world. They would have a tendency to go, oh, the world is bad. The system is bad. We sometimes speak in those kind of terms ourselves. And in 1 John chapter 2, and remember the same guy wrote the gospel of John that wrote 1 John, he even says, don't love the world. But he says, don't love the world and the things that are in the world. Our idea of the world is the things, but God loved the world, the whole system. He, he hates that it's been corrupted, but he still loves everything and everyone who is in the world. So again, Jesus starting out with this concept, do you understand that God loves the entire cosmos and he loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son. How much does God love? He was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son. Some translations translate this as his one and only son. The the Greek word that's translated only begotten is is a term, it's a word that has two words combined. The first word is, is the word mono, which means a singular, solely one. And the second word is the word from which we get our word genetics. And what this is saying is God's only genetically related son. Now, in the Bible, it refers to God's people as his children. We're even told in the New Testament that we can become sons of God, we, but we don't become God And there's something about Jesus that is uniquely a son of God because he is composed of the same genetic material, if you will, as God because he is himself God. So he is distinctly different. Angels are called sons of God because he made them. But God didn't make Jesus. He is connected to him. And so he is the most treasured thing that comes close to the heart of God, is this one who he is composed of the same divine substance. And he gave him, that's how much he loves. For the Jews, they would see this as being crazy, unbelievable. Because to the Jew, having a son to carry on your name, to propagate your biology was everything to them. To not have one would be like, when I die, I actually die. Now, for us in a Western culture, we see people rejecting their kids all the time. You know, just dumping them off, leaving them, ignoring them, wishing they didn't have them. But we are an individualistic culture in the West. So we see everything as it relates to me. And I would sacrifice myself 
<laughs> you know, th that's who I really am. So to give myself, man, it better be something I really care about. But most of the world, and if you're from a, a non-Western country, if you're from Asia or somewhere else, you are what we call a collectivist culture. And this was the Hebrews, this was the Jews of those days. They regarded all of their people, all of their family, as being them. So as long as you had a child who could perpetuate your name, that meant you were still going to live through your child. Because their mindset was, if it happens to anyone in our family, it happens to me. This is why in collectivist cultures, quite often, people don't even mind giving their life for a cause that seems crazy. Because if they feel like they are helping their people, then they feel like, well, that's what it's about. It's about the people as a whole. Now, as you develop a family, you find out that generally, as a Christian, you become more collectivist. You would give your life for your kids or your grandkids, most of us probably would, because we're getting into that mentality. But to the Jews in the first century, that would just be a given. Now, there was one case where someone was willing to offer their only begotten son. And the Jews know this case well. It's the story of Abraham, who gets to be almost 100, and he and Sarah hadn't had a biological offspring. Abraham had had a, a child through um, one, of the, one of the servants, through Hagar, had Ishmael, but God had promised that he and Sarah would have a begotten son, a genetic offspring, and that's what he was going to do. Finally, as an old, old man and an old, old woman, they finally had a son. And to them, Isaac was the way that Abraham and Sarah would continue to live after they were gone. And so they were just overjoyed at this. They named him Laughter, Isaac. And then God told Abraham, I want you to take your only real son between you and your wife, and I want you to take him up onto the mountains of Moriah, up which was near where Jerusalem is, and I think the highest point in the mountains of Moriah is Mount Calvary, where Jesus ended up being cru crucified, which is an interesting sidelight. But he said, take him up there and sacrifice him. And Abraham was willing to do that. It was hard. It was painful. But he knew that Isaac came from God, and he knew he couldn't tell God no. And the Jews look back on that. Now, we all look at it and go, it's amazing that he would do that. I wouldn't do that. If you call me this week and say, I think God just told me to sacrifice my only child, I will say, well, hang on just a minute. I'll get on another not line and I'll have people come with straight jackets and take you away. So this is pretty unusual. This is the only time God ever said it, and he said it for a reason, because he wanted to demonstrate the kind of love that he would have in giving his son. And so the Jews look at that and go, I mean, it's great that he didn't have to sacrifice Isaac. It's great that no one else got that test because most of us would fail. But at the same time, the Jews were so proud that Abraham would take the most valuable thing in all the world to him, and he was willing to give him up because of his devotion to God. And so they had heard that story. But now, as Jesus declares this, maybe it rung with some memories for Nicodemus, but at the same time, it was shocking. Not only because who in the world would give their only son, the one who would perpetuate their life, but the idea that God would have a son, a genetic offspring, uh, that's... That seems crazy to him. Now, in the Old Testament, there are hints of there being a son of God. Um, we look at it now like Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Government will be, be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He'll have a government that will never end. So we can see it, but 
for a Jewish scholar in the first century, they never got it that way. They didn't understand it that way. And they tend still, Jewish people, to interpret those kinds of scriptures as referring to Israel rather than to a literal individual who is God. And, and yet he would become a man. So this seems kind of far-fetched to Nicodemus, that God would have a son. But he, even if he's figuring, wow, you're speaking metaphorically, that is some kind of crazy love, that God would give his only son? Love is always about giving, ultimately. You show how much you love based on what you're willing to give. And he's saying, here's how much God loves. He gave something that anyone would gladly give everything else they have for that. And he was willing to give it. And ultimately, this is a prophecy concerning Jesus dying. He knew he was born to die. And so Jesus is speaking ahead about when he would be offered as a sacrifice. In an in a eerie reminiscence of what Abraham almost had to do, thought he was going to do with Isaac. So, God loves the world so much that he was willing to give his only begotten son. Why? So that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. Now, the, the idea of giving so that people could be saved so that who could be saved? That whoever, in the King James, it's whosoever, but it's the little word pos that just means all. It's like this gift is open to all because he loves all of creation. He particularly loves all of humanity, and the sacrifice was sufficient for everyone in the cosmos to be saved, to have a life that would go on forever, that would be eternal in its depth and in its longevity. Whoever, I'm so glad he said whoever, because, you know, for a Pharisee, and really often for me and the way I would think about it, there are some people who sure don't deserve it. There, you know, I like to think, I, I can get a hold of the fact that when, when God gave his son, he was thinking of us. But he was also thinking of all of those who would reject him. He was thinking of everyone. And he wanted to give an opportunity to everyone. That takes a lot of love. To die for someone like me, who would become such a good person, <laughs> still a stretch. But dying for people who just keep rejecting him, to make that offer to whoever would believe, that begins to show us the scope, the breadth, the depth of his love. And it's whoever believes in him. That word believe, we have a, a wrong concept of it. We use the term belief in terms of thinking, yeah, I give mental assent to that. I see that as a distinct possibility. I look at it and go, yep, sure, I believe. I mean, at the beginning of this NBA season, basketball season, I looked at the Lakers roster, and you go, they got Dwight Howard, they got Steve Nash, you got the best player in basketball, Kobe Bryant, Meta's coming back, you got um, Pau Gasol, if he plays anything close to what he's done in the past, we will be in the finals against the Miami Heat. And with a, with a good break, I think we can win the championship. I really believe that. As the year progressed, I was starting to lose some belief. And even, you know, when they, they had been so bad and Kobe said, I guarantee we're going to make the playoffs. I believed him. Because the sheer will that Kobe Bryant has, I thought he will somehow get them to the playoffs. But then when he tore his Achilles tendon and he was out, even though they made the playoffs, I'm like, ah, you know, they could still have a chance. It's still possible 
that they can put it together. Some of the young guys can step up. Blake can get hot. Nash can get hot. And Dwight can dominate defensively. They, I could see them beating San Antonio. And then the next round isn't too bad. And Oklahoma City, who they'd have in the finals of their side of the bracket, you know, you never know. Westbrook just got hurt. So I'm thinking, okay, this could happen. I still went into the playoffs sort of optimistic. Well, they've lost the first, well, they lost the first two in San Antonio. But it was fairly close games. So I thought, we could still do this. We'll win at home. The third game, they got blown out by 31 points in L.A. Now they're down three games to zero. This morning, I heard on ESPN Radio a promotion for today's game at 4 o'clock. And they said, Laker fans, they're down 3-0 to San Antonio. Tune in and take it like a man. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) and I love that, but it's like, you know, uh, am I going to watch the game today? No, I'll, I'll take a nap instead. Because now I have absolutely no faith, no conviction that the Lakers are going to win even another game. Is it possible that they'll win one game before they get eliminated back in San Antonio? Sure. But my faith has dwindled. The faith that the Bible talks about isn't like, yeah, I could see this happening. The faith that the Bible talks about is, will you put your trust in this. Whoever trusts in him. Not just, not just saying, yeah, I'm a Christian because all the other religions are kind of stupid and most people believe Christianity over other religions. So yeah, I'm a Christian, I guess. I'm an American. I have the idea of Jesus and a manger and, and you know, I got his jewelry and with crosses and everything. And so yeah, I'm a Christian. That's not the idea here of believing in him. This literally means, will you place your trust in him? Will you go all in to say, I know that he did this, I know he gave himself, and my life is being laid on the line that I'll trust him for everything. I will trust what he says. I will trust that if I do what he says, it's going to work out the way he says it will. He said he will come back for me, and I'm going to absolutely count on that. I'm going to live my life like I believe that. Well, that's what biblical faith is. And the word faith is the same word as whoever believes, whoever is believing, whoever is in the process. Now, we never have that faith perfectly until we get to heaven. But While we are here, we always have to ask that question, do I trust him? How much am I trusting him? Is he the, am I putting all of my eggs in that basket and going, like Paul said, if it turns out Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we are pathetic. Do we trust him that much that we're going all for what he has done? Because that's the person who Jesus says responds to the love of God by receiving the life that he offers. Whoever. It's not if you're good enough, it's whoever. It's not if you're Jewish enough, if you're religious enough, if you do the right things enough, it's whoever will trust him. Trust is a decision that we make. Whoever does that gets life that'll go on forever. When does everlasting life start? When you die? No, everlasting life starts and and continues to perpetuate forever, but the life starts when you trust him, when you put your faith in him. The alternative, here he uses the word perish. Now, there are some people who would read this and think, believe in what's called annihilation, where the people who reject Jesus Christ end up going somewhere Maybe they burn for a little while, but then they just burn up and you turn into nothingness. Um, that word can kind of mean that, and it's why some people get you know, confused about it, but the rest of the Bible has much to say as well. What, what perish is is a process of something being destroyed or deteriorated. And what he's saying here is you're, you'll go on. 
the way we know it, the, the Antichrist, for instance, in the book of Revelation, is called by this same word, Apollyon, destroyer. And it says that he and the false prophet and Satan and everybody who rejects Jesus is thrown into the lake of fire, and that burns forever and ever without end. And so, personally, I believe that what he's talking about perishing here, he's saying that if you reject Jesus Christ, you will be constantly deteriorating in a place called hell, and, but that's just going to go on. It's a constant process, and the alternative of which is everlasting life. Now then, he says, God didn't come into the world, and, and notice this, where he says, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn. The word there means to judge and, and uh, decide, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved rescued. So often we think that Jesus came in order to tell everybody they're going to hell. The news that he has is not about hell. He doesn't go into great details about it anywhere. The news that he tells is, a, is an announcement of life. Why would you not want that life? But he goes, I didn't come to condemn. Now, to a Pharisee, this would have been sort of bizarre, too, because he would think the role of religion is to condemn people, is to let people know they are in serious trouble. So why are you saying, I mean, if God sent his son into the world, you'd think it would be to tell him, you guys are in big trouble. But Jesus said, no, actually, and if you read on for the rest of the chapter, he says, he says actually, people in the world are already condemned by not believing. Because he said, the condemnation is this, people prefer darkness to light. People push away from the light. What he's saying is, everyone in this world has been affected by something called sin, and what that sin does to you is it makes you want stupid things. It makes you want to do the things that causes you to deteriorate. Now, if you ask yourself, am I condemned, and you, you don't know Jesus, all you have to do is look in the mirror. Compare how you look right now to how you look on your driver's license. And you go, yeah, something's wrong. And then think about the choices that you make in life. I mean, I can tell by what I want to eat that there's something in me that's trying to destroy me. I never crave vegetables. I don't think, you know, I just love to eat fruit. No. I want a cheeseburger really bad, even right now. <laughs> and that is part of what's destroying me, doing what I feel like doing. And so what Jesus says is, just look at yourself. Look at the way you live. Look at the decisions that you make. Look at the people you're attracted to. Look at what you want to do. Look at when you get surprised and angry. Look what comes out of your mouth. It's destruction. It's constant development and deterioration. It's the process of perishing. This is a part of your life. And he goes, you know what? You don't have to labor that with people. If you explain it to them, they already get that. There are some people who think that when we evangelize people, that we need to convince them that they are sinners, make a major point of the fact that they are sinners. And most witnessing approaches revolve around, okay, first we gotta cover this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, if you just explain to people that sinning means doing things that aren't good for you, sinning is doing things that really you don't wanna do once you think about it, you don't have to weigh it real heavily for them to understand. Okay, if that's what you call missing the mark, yep, <laughs> I do that. People get offended when we keep going, you, 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 you're a sinner because you do this, and we don't go, I am too. I, I can connect with you in this way. But Jesus here says, when God sent his son into the world, it wasn't to bring a message about condemnation. That's why I'm not spending a bunch of time talking about what it is to perish. But God came into the world through his son so that people could figure out 
life so that people could connect with God and have a life that's abundant. Jesus said, I came that you would have life and that more abundantly. And you don't have to know a whole lot about sin in order for you to know you're guilty. You know it. You were condemned before Jesus ever came into the world. The Jews knew this because they had to keep coming regularly to kill innocent animals so that they could acknowledge their own sin. But even someone who wasn't a Jew had a sense of there's something wrong with me, and I think people today do. But God loves the world so much that he gave his one and only son, and he opens it up to whoever will trust him. Perishing is no longer an option. Everlasting life is the heart of what he offers to us today. And it just happens to be a good life that will go on forever. And then the qualification, and by the way, don't get hung up on this thing of condemnation. Anyone who looks honestly in the mirror will admit they're condemned because they love darkness rather than light. They prefer doing things that aren't good for them. And so Jesus lays this out and says, this is what God wants you to know. This is what he wants you to understand. You need to let this sink into you. That is the heart of the gospel. That is the heart of what it means to be a Christian, to trust in Jesus, to become one of his followers. It's understanding this. And this tells us the very heart of God, that we will never forget how much he loves us. We will never forget how simple it is to trust him. And we will never lose sight of the fact that our option was life or perishing, you know, abundance or deterioration. And we start with condemnation because we already know that. We relish in the gift of the Son of God for us. Now, most of us go, yeah, I, I believe that. Yeah, John three sixteen, good verse. You know, I tried to get it on my personalized license plate, but somebody already had it. But let's remember that we, the reason we are studying what Jesus says in 2013 is because we want to listen to what he says so that we can become more like him. So now John 3.16 is also, and 17, is also a measuring stick, a rubric of how much am I like Jesus? So we look at it in a little different way. I look at it and I say, God so loved the world that he gave. And I have to ask myself, do I love the world? Do I love the world like he does? Do I love people who don't know him? Do I love the environment? Do I love the beauty of his creation? Do I appreciate the cosmological system, including, especially at the heart of that, the people who live within that ecosystem how much do I love them? How much do I care about them? If I don't love, if I look at the world as being, oh, they're disgusting. I don't want anything to do with them. My heart is not the heart of my Father. That's for sure. My heart is inconsistent with the reason why Jesus died, without a doubt. So if I say, I, got some, I have a ways to go to work on loving the cosmos, and I think most of us would go, yeah, that's true. But love is always shown by giving. Giving is always the sign of love. It's always the production of love. So we ask ourselves, what am I giving? In what ways am I sacrificing? If his love, co love caused him to give the most important thing in his life, how much am I willing to give up to show that same love? What am I willing to do for the cosmos, for the system, for humanity as a whole, for whoever? And that too becomes, well, he gave his only son. For me, I don't have time to give, can't afford to give money, don't really want to, you know, I don't have the energy to pray, to, you know, look, I drag myself to church whenever there's really nothing on. And, and, and on holidays always, or if somebody invites me to go out to lunch after church. But I think I'm sacrificing enough. 
when I pay my taxes, after I cheat and twist them, I consider that to be a gift to God. <laughs> and when I, like, I'll throw a, you know, a dollar in the basket for the, you know, Santa Claus in front of Walmart at Christmas. I'm, I'm a giver. Really? I mean, what does he want us to sacrifice? And we have to ask ourselves, the things that are most important to us are the most important things that we need to be willing to give. And so we ask ourselves that. Are we giving as he does if we want to be like him? And then whoever. Are we open to whoever will believe? Are there people that we have an opportunity to share with them in a very natural and normal way, not like preaching on the street corner to them, but actually going out of our way to have a conversation with someone the way Jesus often did because they are a part of whoever. Do we look at people driving by us? Do we look at people at the mall? Do we look at our neighbors and go, they are part of the whoever that has an opportunity to find God because he loves them. So how much is my heart aimed at whoever. And how much am I really trusting him? Am I doing what he says and showing a trust that's in him? It's trusting him. If I'm worried, am I constantly plagued with worry? I gotta go, wow. I'm not trusting the way he calls us to trust. If there are things that we think God wants us to do, but we feel like I couldn't do that. It would fail. It would be too expensive. It would just be too inconvenient. Are, are we understanding what it means to really trust him? Are we hanging on to salvation because we're, we're like me with the Lakers early in the season? Ah, they could do this. Is that the level of our trust? Or is there a trust that says, I am going all in. I'm putting my life on the line because I believe in him. It doesn't mean you don't ever doubt. It doesn't mean that there aren't times when you waffle. Hey, that's us. We're still carrying our flesh, and we're still lugging some of that condemnation around with us. But in the thrust of our life, have we put it all on the line ever? And is that something that we continuously do? And is our life something that reflects eternity, eternal values? Do we even live a life that anyone would ever admire or desire for themselves? Or are we just living a cruddy, boring life and waiting for heaven, and we think all of a sudden, my life's going to get great when I get to heaven? God wants us to live our lives in such a way that people see how we are doing now in a fallen, condemned world, that we stick out as being different. That's what his life calls us to be because that's what he does. And I think that we can look at this scripture and instead of just going, for God's love, give us only God's son who shall believe in him, shall not perish by everlasting life. <laughs> know that verse. To going, I am blown away by God's love, the breadth of his love. And I'm amazed by the commitment that he calls us to. And I am now living the life best I can. I'm trusting in him. That's a whole different matter. That's something whereby we can't ever afford to forget John 3.16. This is not just a verse for kindergartners. This is a verse for every one of us. And I would challenge you this week, kind of live in this truth and, and use it as a measuring stick and ask yourself, how much is my life reflecting this kind of son of God. And that shows you how you're doing in terms of becoming like him and representing him. It's tough, but it's a blessing because this really can happen. We really can grow in this kind of faith. Now, if you're here today and you've never really, you're on, yeah, I kind of, I'm on Jesus' side like a fair weather, you know, like a Laker fan that's now a Clippers fan. Yeah, I'm, I'm going with the winner. But, yeah, to be honest, I don't know if I've ever completely trusted him. I'm not sure if I've done that. Maybe you don't even believe in him. 
But if your life is going great, if you're just living your life the way that you want, making all your own decisions, and you go, man, life is awesome for me, and you really feel that way, well, hopefully the world will last long enough and you'll last long enough that life will teach you that you're not making it. But if it's great for you now, that's fine. But my heart is for for everyone, but especially for people who are starting to discover the great profound truth that my life's messed up. This isn't going the way I planned. This isn't feeling like what I thought life should feel like. And if you have never trusted in Jesus Christ and given him permission to be your Lord, do that today. It's the most important decision you will ever make in your life. And you can do it simply by in your heart saying, wow, you really do love me. Everyone else loves me conditionally, but you love me that way. I will trust you. And if you just do that in your heart, everything changes. All of a sudden, something will happen in your life that now there's a reason to live. Now pieces are starting to fall into place. You can start over. Jesus died for you and rose again so that you could start over, and he wants you to do that. If you've never done that, there'll be people down here in the front after the service who would just love to pray with you. That's it. Just come down and pray, and they'll get you started on this new life. But for the rest of us, if we look at our lives and go... I would get saved if I wasn't already. <laughs> I am messing up. I, you know, it's not working. It's not abundant. It doesn't look like something that I want forever. In fact, I can't wait till this life gets over. Then maybe you need to get back to the love and the commitment that he calls us to and decide to begin to take on his heart, to love as he loves, to give as he gives, to trust as he calls us to trust and to stop condemning other people and blaming them to begin to relish life that'll last forever. Begin to live a life now that's worth lasting forever. That's what he calls us to do. And let's do that. Look at this verse throughout the week and see what it tells you about what life looks like and walk in that. And again, if you don't know Jesus, come down to the front. You can get to know him this morning.